lucky I get to see all of you these past few days. I know. I feel like we've officially become family. We've, we've moved in together. Yeah. It's amazing. We've, <laughs> we're officially living here now. Well, everyone is here to um, sort of learn more about what the beauties are about, what all of your work is about, and the, what you're up to in the world. And so we're going to start with you, Karis. You founded a clothing line at 10 to combat bullying and colorism. What was your inspiration for that clothing line? And what, how does it sort of, like, why do you, how, what do you think about when you're trying to inform those pieces? My inspiration behind my clothing line was because I was being bullied for my dark skin complexion. So I wanted to put something out there to the community, to the world, to let them know that you are beautiful no matter what anyone tells you and that you should not let anyone get into your ear and say, oh, you're ugly, oh, you're this or that. No, you're beautiful no matter what anyone tells you. Confidence. Tell, will you tell us a little bit, like, what the first few projects were that you worked on that, what was that like? Okay, so first, my first few projects like that were huge, I partnered with Nike and LeBron James. Woo! That was amazing. Um, I actually was featured in LeBron James' 16th shoe where he picked 16 um, women that inspired him to make his 16th shoe that were designed by all African American women. Amazing. So amazing. Mama Cax, you were on the cover of Teen Vogue, September 2018. You said love and fashion um, sort of bloomed once you start dressing, right? And so tell us about what wearables mean for you in fashion. What? So can you What wearables that? mean for you in fashion? So for me, just being in the fashion space is not something that I thought would ever happen. And even when I decided to um, signed with an agency, I was told there, you know, there weren't a lot of models like me or that it would be hard to sort of like pitching me to different brands. How old were you at the time and how, how long ago was that? That was a year ago. Wow. It's only been a year. Um, so just not only stepping into that space, but showing that there's space for people with disabilities to be in that space has just been really amazing. Amazing. And where is that all going for you? Like what's the, what's the future hold for you? Um, I guess a lot. I've been partnering with different brands, um, not only just in mainstream fashion, but having the conversation about adaptive fashion. So seeing how brands can include a portion um, as part of their brand to just be more adaptive to people with disabilities who have trouble dressing up um, in general. So I do a lot of that and also finding ways to empower young women and girls to embrace and love their bodies. Um, because one of the challenges for me was after my surgery, being left with a lot of scars, I found that it was hard accepting myself. So just being able to show younger girls that it is possible. Um, Noor, you spoke on Thursday night about putting on hijab and channeling your mom. and. Um, and, and, know, and knowing you is sort of a um, healing sort of process for me, because like growing up, like a, a lot of my family um, were, were, it does wear hijab, and I was hid the fact that my family was Muslim, right? I never wanted people to know. Same. I, I was like, please don't know, please don't ask. Like I was. I used very... to pray about, like I used to pray that my mom would forget to wear her headscarf out because I didn't want her to. Listen, I was, I was, I was the person that used to give my mom a hard time, and I feel so guilty about this. About when she would answer the phone in a different accent, I would, I would, I would give her such a hard time about that. So for you. Like how, like for you, you chose to embrace your heritage, your culture, your faith. Like what, where did that all come from? Because I'm just so curious, like what that pr path was for you. So it definitely wasn't an easy path for me specifically. Wearing the hijab was something that I grew up thinking absolutely I was never going to do. It wasn't something I wanted to embrace. And heavily because I was so sure that I wanted to be on television, that I wanted to be a reporter and I wanted to tell stories. And I had never seen anybody with it on before. So to me, the only explanation could be that you had to look like what you saw on television to work in television. And that was because of the, the stark d lack of diversity and representation. But putting it on was really a, a process of finding myself and trying to embrace my identity. 
Um, people always ask me, like, were you ready when you put it on? And this doesn't just go for the hijab, I think it goes for all aspects of your identity. Are you ever ready to put yourself on? And I don't think anybody is ever ready. I think that um, to, to really hone in on who you truly are at heart is a journey and a process, and it's so something that's always ongoing. But I put, so I put this on and I chose to wear my identity at a time where I was feeling broken and lost and I had no idea who I was or who I was going to become, but I wanted to feel a sense of living for something bigger than myself. And so I saw the strength that my mother embodied through it. My younger sister put it on before I did um, and I saw that strength in her. And when I did put it on for the first time, um, I think it shocked everybody because no one thought I was going to, and wearing the hijab is, has to be a choice. So everybody thought that I was gonna take it off and it, I wasn't gonna stick to it. And, um, and it was something that like, I realized opened so many doors for me, for me because I became the best version of myself when I chose to embrace myself authentically. I mean, I, yes. I mean, and that's the truth for all of us, right? I think that's like what we are all trying to do every day is find that confidence to come into ourselves, really? Which and sounds so easy as a, as a meme and a mantra, but it's such a hard journey. But we also don't celebrate it enough. I don't think that we create spaces that are welcoming enough for people to come in and say, this is who I am, and like love and accept me as I am, and, and celebrate my strengths for who I am. Like, I, it's it's such a, lo a constant process, and I was saying this yesterday when I was speaking with Yara, there were times where I was hired and I thought, oh my gosh, I finally got this dream job, I'm finally where I need to be. It, it took so long to get here and it was after so many rejections, and then when I got there, they wanted to put me into a box of everybody else who had come before me instead of embracing my differences and what I had to bring to the table. And I think when you don't create a space for people to actually embrace their differences and what makes them unique and what makes them vulnerable and what society deems as their weaknesses and instead of seeing them as a weakness, celebrating it as a strength. Because for me personally, the thing that everybody told me was going to make me fail was the reason that I became so strong as a journalist today. And it's something that isn't, thank you that I constantly, like anytime I'm, in, I, I'm before an audience, like one as incredible as you guys, I always try to mention like, we, we truly have to learn that what makes you different, what makes you unique, the thing that you're the most insecure about is going to be the thing that's going to allow others to connect with you, to build with you, to feel safe with you, and then go on and be the best version of yourself possible. Preach, preach. So it's with that in mind that we thought about the tenets around the beauties, of redefining beauty, creating the community you see here in front of you and really celebrating self-expression. Um, you are all blazing trails in terms of redefining beauty and self-expression. Um, what, can, what can this audience learn from you and how you built community for yourself? How did you build support for yourself? What were those first few months, weeks like when you were starting to go down the journey of really making this your business, your passion? Like, can you sort of help? Because a lot of our audience really is, we're all the same, right? And I think everyone's here to learn from each other. And so what, this is for all three of you, what can you share about your journey, but the skills and the approach in building your community? Do I start? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> Okay, I'll start. Um, for me, when I was first starting, I, early on, I realized the importance of social media, and that's how I started. For, um, when I was younger, I used to cover my prosthetic because I didn't want anyone to know that I had a prosthetic leg. It was something I was ashamed of. And eventually, I ended up finding the power to sort of like show myself and find pride in it and started sharing my story on social media. And why, what I didn't expect was that I'd find so many people who could relate to my story. Whether they also had scar, they're cancer survivors, they're amputees, or just dealing with you know, body image issues. And I saw this opportunity to try to make the body positive movement more inclusive. But the most important thing was knowing that social media was not enough and I had to bring it back to my community and connect in person. 
Um, so I started doing more body positive meetups um, and talking to different high school and middle school um, kids. It's so simple to say that you love yourself, but there's so much power in it, knowing that the minute you do, you start embracing yourself and you become more confident and so many doors open from there. So I think just loving yourself, being confident, and whatever work you do, make sure you bring it back to your community. Could you repeat oh. the question? Yeah. I'd love to know how you built your, like, your first few months in your community and how you think about how you incorporate the community into your work. Okay, so first, how it all really started, uh, my sister posted a picture of me on Twitter and the hashtag was flexing in her complexion. And a lot of the comments were like, oh my gosh, she's so beautiful, I love her hair. And I was like, those were the exact same things I was being bullied for. So for me, changing a negative into a positive made a big impact on my community because a lot of people look up to me now for what I do or what I put out there to the world, just letting them know that you're beautiful. Because the other night, you actually were thanking your, you thanked the people that were your haters and your bullies. Oh, yes, I did, because you always have to thank the people who brought you here. So. Right? Yeah. Right? I thought that was so powerful. Like, I thought about that for myself, like, really sort of taking a moment to acknowledge the haters and the bullies and being <laughs> like, thank you for really, like, but I think it's like, it's, those are the things that propel you to become better and to push you forward, so... Nora. I love that, and I, I always try to keep that in She mind. dedicated her award to <laughs> She dedicated to her award to the haters. Yeah, that was awesome. Boss. Um, for me, starting out, I also had a similar situation where years ago when I was in college, I obsessively was shadowing other journalists, um, and I was just kind of like building this Rolodex of people who were working in this industry, and at the end of every single time I would shadow them, I would say, hey, do you think I can do this? And a lot of people would be like, to be honest, I don't know, I don't think so, it's never happened, and whatever. So finally one day I shadowed a local journalist and she had taken a picture of me at an anchor desk and I posted it on Facebook and I said, this is what my dream looks like and I'm going to make it happen. And it was something for like my friends and family, it was private, um, and then it had gone viral. And from there, um, my family and I kind of got together and we were like, how can we how can we share with other people that if they truly embrace their, their identity and choose to pursue what they know is their personal legend, is their legacy, is what's true to them, that they will be successful because we have this group in this community of bundles of passions and vulnerable spirits who truly will thrive. And so we created a hashtag called Let Nor Shine. My name Nor means light. And so we wanted to encourage other people to let their inner lights shine. And from there, we had thousands of people who were reaching out all over the world who were saying things like, I'm changing my major, I'm, I'm like quitting my job, I'm taking this course. And it was like everybody who had been told no by society because of something or felt too nervous or insecure because they didn't see themselves in the spaces that they wanted to be a part of had gotten together and they were like, no, we can do this. And so a piece of advice that I have is that if you're in this room today, it means you have access to the internet. And the internet can be a really scary, terrifying place, but the internet is also what brought all three of us on stage today and allowed us to not only become leaders in the community, but also feel less alone in the spaces that we were going into. So even when I walk into a boardroom and I feel alone in there, I know that I can pick up my phone and see hundreds of thousands of people who are still sharing this moment with me and that we are at service to those people and we are doing this for something that's bigger than ourselves. All, all three of you are really role models to people here and people all over the planet. Who are some of the people that are your role models that you look up to? Some of my role models are Lupita Nyong'o because she's in the most biggest movies right now, such as Black Panther, Us, and many more. And also, um, Marseille Martin, um, she's just, she just created history recently for the movie Little. And Nia Kim Gatwitch because she showed us on all, all social media how beautiful she was and her complexion. So those are who I look, look, look up to. Amazing. I feel like growing up it was always 
hard to find like a role model because I. It could be on any. You can have multiple. Yeah, for sure. Um, I didn't really have anyone that sort of like looked like me in any magazines or you know any way I sort of like looked really, but. I always felt like I had to be the person that I needed. Um, and this was sort of like part of this whole identity. I created this persona, Mama Cax, who started blogging, and eventually I sort of like became her. But I feel like when it comes to role models, I really don't have to look for, far. I think um, very close to home, my sisters, my mother, single mom, came here um, and raised five daughters on her own. Um, my friends doing amazing things, um, just sort of like doing great things in their community, having to come out when they're not accepted. There's so many people in my circle in general that are my role models. Amazing. How about for you, Noor? Um, growing up, my biggest role model besides my parents were, was definitely Oprah. I mean, she was the only person, to be honest, that like, Growing up, I saw who wasn't white on television, and that gave me hope to be able to like tell stories and get people to open up to me. Um, I absolutely love certain journalists who I find have broken barriers um, by really connecting with people on a human level, including people like Lisa Lang, Christiana Mumpour, uh, Katie Couric, Sold It Out O'Brien, and then a lot of people don't know about Nellie Bly, but she really, really propelled me into investigative reporting. She was the first uh, woman to be an investigative reporter in the country and covered a story where she put herself in um, an asylum that was notorious for mistreating people. And the first documentary that I ever produced myself was similarly about an institution that housed people with intellectual disabilities and was notorious for abuse as well. Wow, amazing. Wow, I'm like, who am I? I'm like thinking about, I'm like, I, I feel like I always think about when I'm like, what would Serena Williams do right now? That's like, I just, that's like she, the way she just refuses to give up, refuses to be, I, I love that she's like, no one will control my narrative, I control my narrative, and I'm gonna wear whatever the fuck I want, and I'm doing it the way I wanna do it. I love her for that, just saying. I asked myself that question. I, I almost wanted to throw it back at you, and then I love that you said it that way, because similarly to what you were saying about like really becoming your own role model, I think a lot of us, part of why we become leaders, and this is for everybody, is when you don't see the exact role model that you want, you have to become that, that person. And there's one person that really inspires me, actually, his name is Leon Ford, who is running for city council in Philadelphia, and he was, um, he was shot by a police officer and is paralyzed from the waist down now. Um, and I will never forget something he said to me when he was telling us that he started running for city council and he was like, I didn't see the person that I needed to protect me in the government, so I'm going to become that person for myself and for others. And so that really, I think, is such an important thing to keep in mind when you're looking up to people, to remember that everybody is flawed and that you have to be the person you want for others. So, Mama Cax, yeah. you, you, have such a, you have such a deep story. You were diagnosed with cancer as a teen. You lost your hair, with the, which the Haitian culture really values. You lost your leg. How did you, um, was your family the source of strength? Was it faith? Was it your community? Tell us. Um, it, it wasn't just one thing. Uh, so when I was diagnosed, one thing I quickly realized is that I didn't know kids could get cancer. I didn't know what cancer was. And the only stories I heard about it shortly after my diagnosis was that the people who had it died from it. So even sort of like losing my hair, for me personally, that wasn't a big thing. But I did realize how my family was concerned. Um, not only as like black women, we treasure our hair, women in general, and especially being from the Caribbean. And I think from that moment on, I decided to focus on things I knew mattered to me, um, which was sort of like advocating for myself, which I felt like I didn't do at the beginning. Um, I was always this shy kid. Uh, even when I was in pain, I sort of like 
didn't really tell anyone, which allowed the cancer to spread from my bones to my lungs at the time. Um, but I did have a really strong family support system who stayed with me, you know, throughout my whole experience. Um, and I have four younger sisters. I was always sort of like... Four? There were four younger ones. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So my makeup goes missing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at that point, I saw them sort of like becoming the bigger, the big sisters. And I relied on them for a lot of things. So definitely my sisters, my siblings. Amazing. So there's a big debate right now about social media. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it too much? Should we turn it off? Your phone is now telling you if you're using it more or less. Um, as a member of this generation, all three of you, how do you feel like these platforms are helping pro provide sort of like an evolution to society? Do you think there's a downside, an upside? Like where do you see the platforms as a partner to the advancement of your work? Social media is a big impact on me, really. Uh, I've got a lot of jobs from social media, like Nike found me on social media, Walmart, I partnered with Walmart recently for Black History Month. I mean, you're just, you're, you're on fire. You're like, Thank I'm you. doing this. Thank you, so if like... But do you ever turn it off? Do you put it down? No, I don't. <laughs> I okay. don't, I'm obsessed with social media. Do you believe that being on social 24-7 can be mentally harmful to us? Oh, yeah, it can. It okay. really can. I mean, I'm not on it like 24-7. I mean, I have to put it down sometime. But I'm on my phone on Instagram majority of my time. But, like, a lot of people have got really big from social media because some people are very empowering to a lot of kids and adults these days. Like, my generation, so, like, we're... We're the top, like my generation is the top. We're the next generation for wow. everyone. <laughs> I said this the other day, I'm like, 2020 is basically <laughs> what it is. You're right. Change the law. Okay. I have really strong opinions about this. Cause I All right. think that- You have with strong opinions? Yeah, I have, like casually have strong opinions. <laughs> no I'm not way. supposed to have strong opinions about ever, anything cause I'm a journalist, right? No, social media, I think like, like you were saying is so incredible. It like creates such incredible impact. It's literally caused revolutions around the world, right? So there is something to be said about the way that we are connected to the rest of the world, that we are in tune with what's going on. We know what's going on. Everybody can be a storyteller through social media. I think that we have to hold ourselves accountable though for how we use social media and how we consume it. So if you are scrolling through Instagram and I love doing the whole raise of hands thing, but raise your hand if, you've ever, if you ever scroll through Instagram and it makes you feel worse afterwards. Don't lie. Let's see. Honestly. Hands up. It makes you feel worse about yourself. Me, for sure. Yeah. FOMO. And so, so I think that, so in those times when, you've, when you're on social media and you look at someone or you look at someone's life and you're like, man, like, and it gives you a pang where you're like, at this very moment, I'm not happy for that person and I'm not feeling really good about myself. I think it becomes a part of your own responsibility to mute that person, unfollow them, nothing personal, but like be very, very, very conscious of how you consume social media and understanding that social media is a highlight reel. It doesn't show everybody's entire life. It shows you what they want you to see about their lives and so, Keeping that in mind and scrolling with that lens like makes you more responsible in how you treat yourself and your spirit and your mental health. And then on top of that, I think that it's so incredible that we get to create really wonderful communities through social media where like if you see somebody who is excited about something that they're working on and you get to share their work and you get to support their work and you get to cheer them on, it's so amazing that you're able to do that but also you have a responsibility to not be the person to be dogging on someone or to be talking crap about somebody or to be put, being passive aggressive on social media. And I think that, I mean, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term keyboard warriors and, and people who are just really excited to, and confident behind the screen and they're able to like type out something that's nasty and post it thinking that, oh, this person has a million followers. It's not like they're gonna see it anyway. No, they're seeing it and you're making it worse for them to do their job and do what makes them happy. So I think if we're aware of how we use it and what we put out, 
it, it becomes something incredibly wonderful. But like we're living in a time where this is the first generation that has spent this much time on social media and we do not know the effects of it on our mental health. We do. We actually do. We have. We do. Do you want to know? Yeah, I want to know. It's I a downer. Know. Do you want to know it? I know, I know about like the really sad statistic about suicide rates. That one? Yeah. 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 It's harsh. It's so harsh. It's but it's like for the long term, like, we physically don't know what it's doing to our like actual brains. Mm -hmm. So it's like just being aware. And if you have this doubt on you, then you should probably share it. I don't, but I do. But I'm not going to, but we'll talk about it later. Yeah, okay. But do your research. But I do think it's interesting on eBay that one of the things that's trending right now is a flip phone. No. Swear. Because I think people are like, I'm over it. Like, they're just like, I can't. Like, they want a break. They want to just throw their SIM card into a weekend phone and be like, sorry. Because it's, it's just a lot. Yeah. Just saying. Can be. Maybe not. It's also about balance, though, too. It's like, you What's can't ever be like, oh, I'm just going to do a social media detox and get off forever. Because the fact of the matter is it's such a huge part of our culture and our generation. It's about understanding how to manage it yourself. I don't we think we should be having conversations about that, which we don't because everybody nobody has knows. Their own I think everyone's lying that they can manage it. They can't. Yeah. It's too hard. I can't manage it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not on my phone. I swear I'm not. I am I on my I'd phone. I'd be lying if I said that it hasn't helped my career because I remember Specifically, when the first picture of me was posted, I got the same comment over and over again. People were saying how they'd never seen a black girl with a prosthetic leg before. And I realized pictures of like black and brown kids with disabilities were always shown as the homeless kid, the landmine victim. So it was kind of a way to sort of like change the narrative through photographs. But I definitely have to emphasize the fact that you have to curate your feed. Um, I realized I was living in like a little positive bubble in my own social media world because when I ventured elsewhere on social media and saw pictures of me reposted, the comments were not so positive. People were saying things like, we're taking this diversity thing too far, I miss real 80s models or tagging their friends and saying, hey, so and so, would you hit that? So there's a lot of that going on, and no matter how long you've been on social media or how old you are, sometimes it does get to you. Right. So it is nice to sort of like step away from it and just don't read the comments. Don't read the comments. Don't read the comments. Fair enough. Um, do we want to do two quick questions from the audience? Ooh, yes? Okay, we're going to do this one, two. What? So we're going to go one, two. Good? Okay, sweet. Mel, this question is for you. At what point in time did you decide to give us such a platform when it came to BeautyCon? What point in time? I, I, would, uh, I would be lying that it's not an I, it's a we. Um, this platform was already happening. This, is like, this movement was here, was happening. We wanted to be a part of it. We wanted to sort of put a flag in the ground to say that we wanted to supersize it. I think everyone knows that we've done a lot of different things over the past few years to really build it into a larger enterprise, which has been a very wild adventure. Um, there's a lot of things for men in sporting, in events, gaming. There's massive festivals. I just didn't think there was anything that was sort of playing in the world of all of this. I mean, you guys are so amazing. How could you not, really? You know? I think you're, you're the next, yeah. I, th I think they can. Okay, so I just wanted to know for everyone here, how is it that us who are starting our own company can come in and just branch off or just have a booth out here or just be able, no, seriously, because listen, Remember me, I'm gonna be here, Good. okay? I'm counting on I'm it. I'm speaking it into existence. Okay. Females, we're taking over for 2019. I've seen so many, so many females come in here and dominate. I'm not and what you're doing is amazing. I think everyone knows I don't wear makeup. I'm not ever worn makeup. It is a weird thing. It's karmic. I say this to my friends, like, 
what you resist persists. Like my entire life, my mom wanted me to be girly, wear makeup. It would make me break out into hives. As a kid, I would throw up in school wearing dresses. It was terrible. It was terrible. It was a very terrible traumatic experience. And of course, I end up at BeautyCon, right? <laughs> so so what, what has us interested as a team and what you guys are up to here is beyond the cosmetic experience, we're very interested because we believe that if this entire generation of young people, men and women and people who are redefining beauty, are going to take on the conversation of financial literacy, wealth, economic interests, owning your business, being your own bosses, because it's really what it's about, right? Yeah. We're here for it. We're excited. We are very, 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 very excited about that being interesting, so. We love that you founded BeautyCon, by the way. Like, I feel like everyone here is so thrilled it's you and not another old white guy. <laughs> I'm like, I wore a little makeup for you guys today, so. <laughs> My mom will be happy. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. We really appreciate all of you. Thanks for all the support. It's gonna be a wild day.